But if you have a pure carb meal, like a banana or a bran muffin, about within an hour, your sugar goes sky high, but then it drops dramatically because insulin is being manufactured. Mm -hmm. And when insulin goes up, some people are really symptomatic and their sugar drops even lower, sometimes to a dangerous point. They could feel jittery, angry, sleepy, and they know they usually have to eat something. A lot of times it's a donut and a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock. That's not good for you either. And so there are patterns that we recognize and we can individually, N of one, direct people as to the choices they need to make so they can own that future. Let's link up with Krista on The Fix. She's a wellness coach with a focus on mental well-being and physical strength. What's going on, Fix listeners? Welcome back to our latest episode of The Fix Podcast. I'm your host, Krista Huber, and I am excited and delighted to introduce today's guest for this interview, and that is Dr. Florence Comate. Dr. Florence is a well-respected physician, has years of experience in the field, and I'm going to let her go through everything in her bio because I want to just give you guys some highlights before we dive into this episode about all the different topics that we discussed. The ultimate theme and takeaway that I had from this conversation is just really underscoring the fact that your health is so personal to you. And what I thought was fascinating and amazing about her work and her approach with her company is really taking that individualized approach and then being able to study and research it. So you'll hear Dr. Florence reference this concept of N of one. And what I think is extremely fascinating about it is so much of this is rooted in her own personal experience and upbringing and the fact that she's a twin. And I actually didn't even get the chance to ask her this when we were sitting down to have this conversation. But it almost made me wonder, had she not been a twin, how quickly she would have made some of the realizations that she has about while the fact that our genes can be similar and our family history is very important, we are still individuals, even to the level where two people who are genetically very similar as twins have differences about them. So she gives some stories about her childhood where that really started to come to light for her. And I just thought that was a cool personal connection that has totally influenced the rest of her career. If you are somebody who is interested in understanding hormones and understanding how the body changes as we age and really looking to truly optimize your health, then this episode is for you. Dr. Florence talked about an app that her company is building called Grok. It is still in beta testing, but if you want to learn more about it, I am definitely going to learn more about it myself because even with a little bit of research I did before the episode and talking to her and hearing about it directly from the creator, there is so much value in what she is delivering and it's going to be exciting to see the way this company grows and scales and is able to give access to the masses and understanding really critical pieces of your health and looking at blood work and understanding what's important to look for and how to advocate for yourself too inside of the doctor's office. So Definitely won't be the last time we hear from Dr. Florence. Excited for her to make the introduction to the Fix audience. And I hope you guys enjoy this episode. As you heard last week, we are looking for reviews for the show. So if you love it, you liked what you heard, you've been coming back for more, maybe this is your first time and your first introduction to the show. If you have any thoughts about it, if you enjoyed it, we'd really, really appreciate for you to hit that five-star review button whether you listen on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. And if you really loved it, make sure you subscribe so that you never miss your fix every single week. We come out on Thursdays. And with that, let's welcome Dr. Florence to the Fix Podcast. Dr. Komate, welcome to the Fix Podcast. I'm so excited to have you today. We have a lot of hot topics to definitely cover. When I was prepping for this episode and listening to a few other interviews you've done and, and looking at your book and different things, hormones and testosterone and understanding the thyroid are probably questions I get every day, multiple times a day from clients. So I know we have a ton of Fix listeners out there who are going to be tuned in to everything you have to say and wanting to learn more about it. So thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the show. 
to kick everything off, I like to start with a fun question for all of our guests here on the podcast. And I am a big coffee drinker. Love my coffee. Take it very seriously. So I would love to know what your go-to coffee order is or what you like to sip on in the morning. So I, that's a great question. I've heard your podcast too. So I knew that. For me, it's a trick question because I don't drink coffee at all. I figured you might tell me that. (laughs) My identical twin and I grew up with a mother who adored coffee. She was European. So she and her five and six sisters would drink like 10 or 15 cups a day. Oh, my goodness. So we're probably the only doctors who trained and never drank coffee. So luckily, we're gifted also from my mother, probably with tremendous energy. But I love hot chocolate and um, I love a rich cup of it, usually a little later in the morning because it's so rich. Um, and I love the taste, which actually makes me happy, but it also has a, a number of amazing benefits, um, including antioxidants. Flavanols are twice the amount you get them that you might get from blueberries. Oh, wow. And, I didn't know um, that. Phytosteroids. Yeah. So dense chocolate, like more than 70, 72% of really good chocolate, if you can even go up to 80 or 90% is a fantastic health benefit. There are studies about it supporting memory, cognition, and brain function. So actually, I do drink a shake in the morning with berries, and mm-hmm. we add cocoa via in it. Very nice. Um, and the chocolate is so rich that we have to cut it with mango. So it's a delicious way to start the day with a lot of protein. Yeah, that sounds really good. And just to yeah. confirm exactly what Dr. Florence said, you heard it here first. Have your chocolate. It's healthy, right? It does have a lot <laughs> And of twice the oxidants of yeah. green and black tea and even red wine. And I do like the idea too, you know, you re- you reference like the more bitter chocolate, right? And the more dense chocolate. I think the hard time that people have with that is they're like, well, then it doesn't taste the same. But I think drinking it is a great alternative to that. Yeah. And you can actually adjust your taste buds because like years ago, sure, we all like things like M&Ms and- yeah. But the sugar and the milk in in chocolate undermine the benefit. So if you can get your taste palate used to it, it's a huge plus. Good to know. Great. Well, I love dark chocolate, so I think I got to incorporate that into my routine. Very nice. Now, transitioning a little bit more into the serious stuff, let's call it, when we have a guest here on the Fix podcast, what I like to do to kind of kick things off is... Yes, we want to hear about your resume and your credentials. You've been in this field for a very long time and you've had a really interesting journey and I'm excited for everyone else to hear about it. But more specifically in introducing yourself to this audience and explaining what you do and the research that you've done and the type of people that you work with, I'd love to know specifically why the listeners should care about what you have to share with us. That's another great question. What what a nice way to warm up. So let me give you a couple of sound bites, but also just what it's based on. So I'm a Yale trained physician and I was on the Yale faculty for over a couple of decades in with a triple appointment, largely dealing with endocrinology. So adult endocrinology, which covers diabetes, prediabetes, thyroid, osteoporosis, cholesterol, lipids, um, and also reproductive endocrinology, which Mm. is women's health and men's health. Largely, believe it or not, even though we know women are underserved in some ways with respect to hormones, men are underserved. And so andrology, which is comparable to gynecology, but the male version was usually part of gynecology and mostly focused on fertility. Okay. And the third part was pediatric endocrine. So I started my career working with children who were developing too young. They had something called precocious puberty or too slow, or constitutional short stature. And all the conditions that affect us as adults can affect children even sooner than 18. Mm. And so my interest at the time, I started Women's Health at Yale back in the 90s, because I was aware that if I looked at um, data in women, I now we think of them as biomarkers, but then it was just drawing lab tests. 
I could see the diabetes under the surface. I could see cholesterol. You could be 30, 40, 50, because generally it starts changing in your 30s and it's related to hormones. And then I would have women who took care of themselves perfectly, where they would work out, they would eat right. And then they put on three, four, five pounds, nothing I would be familiar with because I never thought like that. But <laughs> And they wondered why, because they were doing everything perfectly. Sure. Well, that's because metabolically and hormonally, we change under the surface. So at that point, that was an epiphany to me because I knew that the numbers look different and would portray the future family history. At that point, thinking family history was a poor man's genetic test. I've changed to think family history is vital. It's actually richer than genetics. And I'll tell you why later. And then I also gave a journal club that showed that in our 30s, our body begins to decline in this convergence of diseases, like we gain weight, usually starting mid 30s, even if we're doing everything perfectly. We it's harder to have children infertility strikes. Um, we start losing bone in our late 30s and muscle. And even if we try to do it right, we're raising a family, we're working, we make those rationales for ourselves. What really is going on is our body's beginning to shift. And that shift is what aging is. And at the time I was proposing that if we stop aging, can we stop diabetes, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's? And that's where I began. And I felt if we could actually work in that realm, we could promote health span and improve health for the rest of your life to match your lifespan. And that if we created optimal health for life, You'd likely be living longer, but the goal was not to ever get sick, to be able to dance at your grand, great grandchildren's wedding mm -hmm. and to go kayaking or parasailing, whatever pleases you at 100. And that's really the goal. How do you stop aging to prevent disease? That's what I think is most valuable. And what we don't know is huge. We don't know what's going on at the cellular level unless we look. And that's really what I'm a proponent for. How do you measure these factors to be able to connect the dots, integrate that knowledge with your health story, and then intervene once you interpret that data so you stop aging and you get people as healthy as possible, whether they're 40, 50, 60, 70, it doesn't matter. There is so much that we can unpack there and so many different directions that we can go. But you know, my first thought is, going off of what you started thinking about back then, how have you created conclusions around the big question of how do we stop aging? Can we stop it and maybe define for us a little bit more about what you mean by stopping it, right? Because every year we're all going to get older. Chronologically. Yes. But not biologically, if you can help it. And the goal is, and some of us are doing it naturally, excuse me, but without having the means and the analysis of what your actually what your actual function is and your performance we can't do it knowledgeably mm -hmm. like i just sat in front of somebody whose data already shows he's a pre-diabetic on his way to being a diabetic he has he's vulnerable because his d is very low so are his b's he has signs of inflammation that involve his immune system almost every body part is on its way to decline. Now he's about 50. So that is very common. But you can see these changes. I see the children of some of my patients who are teenagers or mm -hmm. college students, and it's already evident because it's driven by genetics and the variants in our genes. So by tackling that, at the cellular level, by giving people the right way they need to work out, Maybe they just do aerobics and not resistance. Maybe they're eating certain foods that don't agree with them, or they're taking even vitamin B, but because of their makeup, they need methylated vitamin D sure, because they have a gene called MTHFR, mm -hmm. which is now pretty commonly heard about in, in the community. And without knowing that, we can't course correct. And decline is inevitable. We all die. If we don't intervene, we'll die unhealthy because that's when disease strikes, when we're weak and older. And by stopping biological aging, even as we blow out more candles on the cake, we can actually create health, optimal health. And that's really the goal. Makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I love what you're saying about the the importance of getting the knowledge, right? Like, 
we can read all this information too. And I think it's important to even take it a step further and say, you have to get the knowledge that's personalized to you, right? And really get a picture that's personalized to you. Because you mentioned even with this example of a patient or looking at things like vitamin B, right? It depends on your makeup. So let's go back to something you referenced a couple minutes ago about family history and genetics, because it sounds like you have an interesting perspective on that. So I'd love for you to elaborate a little bit further. I will, but I'm actually going to use what you just said, because the core component, when you ask me, how did I do this? Mm -hmm. So one of the core components, and I mentioned her right up front, is my, the fact that I was born an identical twin. So that was a gift, but my twin and I are different. Doctors. Did you mention that too? Cool. And my brother. Okay. (laughs) There's a lot of doctors in the family, but they like to say I'm the real doctor because most of them are dermatologists or facial plastic surgeons. Okay. And, uh, and so I get all the hard cases. <laughs> um, but what you said is absolutely true. We're all different. And the personalization of healthcare is very difficult. I believe healthcare and medical care has always been personal. Get in front of a good doctor. They're going to talk to you about you. Unfortunately, studies are based on population research. Mm. So a thousand, a million people participate in a new drug or a new intervention or any kind of observation, like the recent observation about aspirin, which I'm not in agreement with because I know there are other factors that might make aspirin, for example, not the best for everyone. So I knew that my identical twin and I weren't alike. So the core concept of what I built the protocols on, and it was an approach that used clinical research. I actually have protocols with the hospital and with the university so that I'm able to publish the data anonymously. Okay. I knew at the time over 20 years ago that if I could prove this prospectively, I would need to report it retrospectively because that's how medicine actually grows. You need to be able to prove the outcomes. So I designed an approach that looked at N of one, meaning if my identical sister and I are different, how can I assume anybody's alike? And we have the closest gene pool, right? But for example, I can live on sushi and sashimi and really dislike seeded vegetables, too many seeds. Like I go for the European cucumber, not the regular one. And I don't like squash and zucchini. And she's this amazing gardener. I kill plants. And she makes (laughs) a lot of things with zucchini and squash. And she doesn't know why I push it around the plate (laughs) because I don't like the taste of it, the texture of it. And so I knew inherently we were very different. And that if I could figure out a way to look at N of one, and that's what I established, I figured out an approach that led me, let me, let me, led me to profiling people at certain points in time where you got a baseline and then you looked at them two to three months later. Mm -hmm. And again, and you did interventions in a very organized way, you could see how people responded and what they tracked. And that is, a, those are real examples. I'll, I'll use two common areas that you've heard about, I'm sure. The use of vitamin D over the counter and thyroid supplements. So vitamin D in 20% of us, we cannot take over the counter vitamin D or D3 and convert it to D. We need ergocalciferol, which is vitamin D2, because we have a gene that can't convert over the counter. And that is obvious as we followed people, your vitamin D isn't going up because we really can't get enough vitamin D from food or from the sun. It's been worked out of our genes. Thyroid is similar. A lot of people are on thyroid T4 or Synthroid, but it doesn't transfer to T3. And T3 is the vital hormone we need in our brain. And it's the active form of thyroid. But most people are measured for TSH. They don't translate it to T3 and T4. Mm -hmm. And you have to give a certain number of people T3 in order to get appropriate levels of both free T3 and free T4. So those are differences that can be picked up when you monitor people in a certain preset way. And we can see change over time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I'm really glad you brought up the thyroid example because this is something I talk to clients about often when they're looking to get lab work done. They're often met with a question from their doctor of, 
oh, well, we don't need to test anything other than TSH. And if TSH is a potential problem, then we can look into some of those other markers. And I would imagine you have a different opinion on that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I have a different opinion, but I'd love to hear yours too. I'll start with you. What? What? Because one in eight women have thyroid disease. Right. And I think it's far more ubiquitous as we age chronologically. Yes. What, what is your thought? What so are your thoughts about it? I women? am going to steal an analogy from a friend in the space that she shared with me a couple of years ago when I first started nutrition coaching that I really like. And I think it's easier for clients to understand too, is this idea that TSH versus looking at T3, T4, reverse T3, think of it like going to the post office. And when you look at TSH, treating TSH as the post office itself, let's say the post office is open. Okay, great. The post office is open. TSH is functioning. But what happens if you walk into the post office and you're trying to drop something in the mailboxes and those mailboxes are full? If those mailboxes are full, then the function of the post office being open doesn't really help you very much, right? Because technically it's open, so we know it's working. But if those other things are not operating on the next level, then you're not going to be able to get to the point where you can actually deliver the mail. That's great. I love it because it makes it real life. Yeah. I'll tell you the kind of background to that, um, but I might steal that. that I way know. I thought it was really it. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, TSH is a very wide number that's considered mm -hmm. in the normal range. So it goes from 0.4 sometimes even 0.3 in a lab to 4.5 or five. That is 10 times plus. And so you could be anywhere along that spectrum, but your thyroid hormones themselves, and I'll explain why in a second, can be high, low, or average. And you can still have Hashimoto's thyroiditis mm -hmm. and you can still have Graves' disease. And the reason being is that the thyroid can be independent. And with TSH being so broad, there's no specific way you can actually pinpoint it unless you measure free T4 and free T3. You can also measure reverse T3, but I don't particularly find it that useful. Okay. I think you get all you need because it's a relationship. So yep. there's a relationship. TSH is secreted from the pituitary gland and it goes to the thyroid, which is a butterfly gland around your neck. And it tells the thyroid to function. But sometimes things are off. Maybe the post office is open. Yep. The mailboxes may or may not be working. They don't even pick up the mail. And all of those analogies actually work. So you need to see the combination of those three variables because the way it's set up by the insurance companies is that. If your TSH falls anywhere between 0.4 and 4 or 5, you're fine, right. but you're not. And actually, if it falls at 5 and your T3 and T4 look good, you actually should probably shut it down because you're overstimulating and it's probably due to Hashimoto's thyroiditis and it's damaging to the gland. So that's how an endocrinologist thinks. But I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that was yeah. a great addition. And it's so true. And, and, uh, you know, I assumed that you'd bring up the insurance component of it as well. And that's what I always remind my clients is like, look, there's still a business component to this to a degree. And a lot of times when they're approaching their doctor about it, they're like, oh, well, we don't necessarily need to test that. And I always, I always say to them, I, I let them know, like it's coming often from the place of insurance and let them know that you're working with somebody who requested this information and see if that makes any difference in terms of them being willing to run it. Right. That's exactly true. Now, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about looking at somebody's lab work, but also what you referenced before about checking on certain things every few months and maybe a little bit more about what some of those protocols are that you've developed over the years through the work that you've done. Okay. Um, I'll also take a moment to describe the family history and genetics. Oh, yes, please. Yes. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. that was really your original question. Mm -hmm. And I kind of- That's okay. I, I took- you know, charge of the, yeah, I no harnessed problem. your, we're all individuals. And that's so real. It is actually the core driver of what I do. And you, you now know why. So years ago, genetics was described and it was thought of as rather simplistic. Craig Venter described the genome. It cost $3 billion, by the way, at that point in time, which wow. was about 20 years ago. 
But all that we really looked at were was the DNA. They would break down the DNA and they'd measure the proteins. And they forgot that things have to work to turn things on and off. Sure. There's switches, there's messenger RNA, there's a lot of factors in there. There's protein manufacturing. And any of that can go awry. So all we were really looking at is what the DNA said in terms of protein. Over the years, epigenetics became a big issue, meaning how do you live life? What's the impact of the way you eat or sleep or mm-hmm. don't sleep or don't exercise on the way your genes are expressed? And that was a big unknown. I was lucky, as I mentioned, I knew as an identical twin that genetics couldn't be the whole answer. Otherwise, why were my taste buds different? Why were my eyes a little different, right? Or even with the two of you, like, I I wanted to bring this up when you were talking about the zucchini, and now this kind of relates because of your comment around epigenetics, like environment, right? I'm sure growing up in the same household, you were served a lot of the same foods. So you would think that that influenced some of your taste buds too. And a lot of that was controlled, so to speak, between you and your twin. Yes, because you live in the same environment and you're eating the same thing. But I can even give you a story from when I was like seven or eight. Sure. Because I happen to like liver. My mother was a little old fashioned and she would make liver. Okay. My sister hated it. My mother didn't like liver. So she allowed my sister and brother, also a doctor, not to eat it. And I didn't like lamb or rack lamb. I now, I now like it, but I didn't like it then. And I remember coming home one day and my mother was making lamb. And I said to her, I'm not going to eat it because you know I don't like it. She said, okay, eat it this time. First, she said, no, I'll have to eat it just like the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. And then I said, that's not fair. You let Harriet get away with not eating liver because you don't like it. And all of a sudden, I have to eat lamb. (laughs) So you're absolutely right. And Yet, think about what happens even in our own bodies. So I'll start with being a twin. As a twin, the egg divides either at the two, four, eight, 16 cell stage. Mm -hmm. The later it divides, presumably the more alike you're going to be in some ways. Right. But then you implant in the uterus and there are things like mirror twins or Siamese twins that aren't even completely identical and they haven't even fully separated. Right. And so then you're mature, you, you're born and let's say you're even a singleton. Like I presume you're not a twin. I'm not a twin, but right. But if you draw a line down your face and you've likely heard this before, depending on who you've interviewed, your left side of your face doesn't match your right side. Mm -hmm. And that's a perfect way to describe epigenetics. Why aren't our eyes exactly the same? Why, if you create, you can create actually three faces for each person, one that matches the right one that matches the left and one that's different that we have. And in our world of America, we we actually identify symmetric faces as the most beautiful. Yes. And there's a lot of I studies you in might that. bring that up. Yeah, you're very before. beautiful. You, you have a beautifully symmetric face, but I'm sure looking closer, you know that if you travel further down the body, mm-hmm. whether it's breasts in us women or testicles in men, or any part of our body, the right side is not necessarily like frequently women and men have legs that are slightly different. If you look at one needs a size six and a half, but the other one's actually a seven. And it's a little hard to adjust to that. And sometimes it's more, you know, different than even that. That's epigenetics. That's expression of the genes. That's where I knew understanding how somebody was functioning dynamically and what they were able to do and describing what was going on at a lower level at the cellular level and getting that data, which we think of as precision data, would help drive decisions for that unique human being, um, twin or not. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I know I'm going to move away from the other question that I asked you, but maybe it relates so you can tell me. But the other thing that's coming up for me is hearing you describe this and you wanting to do this research is I've had other uh, researchers and doctors on this show before, and something we've talked about is when it comes to nutrition in particular, it's often really hard to get the support for studies because it can be difficult to kind of hold like the gold standard of what it takes to create let's call it good quality research, right? Like having controlled variables, setting up your hypothesis accordingly. So a lot of times it's not necessarily something that 
uh, anybody wants to fund because the argument would come back that, hey, this is difficult to do. And I think that coupled with some of your comments that you already kind of alluded to with medicine and healthcare, and I've heard you say this on other interviews as well, our uh, approach in the U.S. being more reactive versus proactive, right? That I wonder what kind of case you made and how did you go about conducting this research but getting support for it as people potentially looking at it as even valid or like willing to give it attention? What was that like for you? It wasn't easy because I grew it from scratch, yeah. from nothing. Actually, I had one person working with me at the time and now I have over 40. Okay. And you'll be interested to hear that I actually am now scaling it to an app so everybody cool. can own knowledge. But your question is very insightful. And it's actually, it reminds me of a funny story. I was at a meeting and it was a long time ago, at least 15 years. And the woman on stage had exactly the same issue you talked about in a, a little differently. They were trying to collect women who just ate organically, ate whatever they okay. wanted. Not even, I don't mean organic food, but they just were natural eaters. They okay. didn't count like calories. Diet. They didn't, yeah, exactly. Okay. She couldn't find, she needed 50 people. She found one. So she couldn't do the study. Mm -hmm. The way we look at it, and this is there's, there's multiple parts to this that I think you're going to find fascinating. First of all, I don't believe, I don't like the word diet because I think it conjures up all sorts of negative yeah. stuff. I You're also a, don't like trends. I'm in alignment trends. with you there. I also don't like trends. I think that we jump on a bad wagon in some ways like lemmings because our celebrities do something that mm -hmm. works and we don't know that it's going to work for us. Celebrities can deliver babies and get into the gym and be whipped and look amazing in a month. That's right. not a reality for most no. of us, right? Same thing happened with the craze for Ozempic and Manjaro recently, which I've been interviewed a lot about. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that at some point, of course. OK, I'm, I'm sure. happy to talk yeah. about it. We have tons of experience because I started years ago with the first agent called Bayetta that you had to have right before you ate. And I had my own experience with mm. it because I wanted it. I test almost everything out if it's appropriate to me. Sure. And just about everything is because we're all human, um, except maybe prostate. I don't have <laughs> <laughs> Being Which a woman, that's a, that's yeah. a positive. Um, and so one of the things we do is we look at the way people make decisions about eating. And I have another real case story that just happened this week. And we're able to do that even more effectively nowadays because of the continuous glucose monitor. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's or CGM, yep. if anybody's ever spoken to you about it. it there I've had Dr. That... Casey Means on the show, and she was actually the person who shared with me the comment that I just made and why I'm asking you this question, because she had told me that it was a difficult part of creating levels like for that reason, because there weren't a lot of people who are willing to support some of this research. And I wore the levels CGM for a month myself about almost two years ago. It was like two years ago in July. And it was really fascinating to do. It was very cool to get that kind of data in real time throughout the day. I agree. And I what I love about it is as an endocrinologist, I can see medical shifts that may not be available to people who haven't lived the like I'm a geek. I actually have it on both arms right now because oh, cool. one failed and I and then I forgot to take it off. So like I'm not sure which one's active. So I don't want to remove it until because <laughs> I wear it all the time. Yeah. Like as long as it's been in existence in the beginning, we could only use it and a person would have to come in, we'd have to take it and met and do the analysis in the office. It wasn't at the time you were eating where the sugar would pop up. Just okay. like now, for example, with the Libra three, you don't need, you need, you have Bluetooth already. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's we actually really cool. did tests. In, in people here, before I started scaling to the app, I tested about um, 20 people with uh, an average age in the 20s. I think it was like 29. Every single person has a disorder of carbohydrate metabolism because it's survival. It's Darwinian. The genes that would keep us from putting on fat die when there's a famine or there's a Holocaust or in caveman times, we, it was feast or famine, right? So we all inherit a thousand variants in genes that make it challenging as we get older and our test chronologically and testosterone falls mm -hmm. and hormone shift. And we cannot balance sugar. I have not met one person yet 
who has optimal sugar. And so we have a very tight range and I'll, I'll turn to the case now because I think you'll find it fascinating where we want your sugar to be no lower than 70 and no higher than 120. Okay. Now that doesn't mean it has to be 100% of the time, mm -hmm. but 90% of the time. And hemoglobin A1C, which is one of the other factors we look at along with fasting glucose and fasting insulin when we're assessing people, tell a whole different story because even the ads for Ozempic that give you the seven as the magic number are meaningless. We have people with perfect hemoglobin A1C that have he that are less than five, which is what optimal is yep. five or less. It means you're not going to be a diabetic in general and you uh, live long. So they're they're correlated by research. And so we're able to tell what's going on. Sometimes it's the thyroid effect sugar. Sometimes it's insomnia. Sometimes it's an infection. Um, so there's a lot of variation. And one of the tests we also do is called an oral glucose tolerance test, which a lot of women who have children have um, a brief version of it, like a half an hour, an hour. Mm -hmm. And they're told, in fact, I met a woman yesterday who all three of her children, she had gestational diabetes, okay. but no one's done anything to follow up with her since in her forties. And that is a mistake because it's like a diagnostic test that you're diabetic. If you have, you're carrying a baby and you're told that you're borderline or you might have gestational diabetes, not only should you take care of yourself as, as well as you can during that pregnancy, because it changes the health of the baby as well. But in the future, it means that it's very likely on, as you get older chronologically, you're going to be a diabetic. So there's other aspects of that. If a woman takes birth control pills in her twenties, she shuts down testosterone and testosterone saves you from diabetes early in life because it allows sugar to be packed away into mm -hmm. muscle that you make with testosterone. As testosterone falls in us women and men in our thirties, by one to 3% a year, we actually have trouble putting that sugar away. And that's why diabetes, the regular sort starts emerging, not type one, that's different, but all the other types. And sure. there are a gazillion other types. So, and the last piece is knowing that when the continuous glucose monitor got invented, even before that time, there were studies at the Weizmann Institute in Israel that showed that were studied in about a thousand women and men looking at their sugars. And what they found, and this is something I think Levels did particularly well, is that if you had a banana, in so some of us, your sugar could go sky high. But if you had a cookie, it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. do that. And the reverse might be true for you. Like I have a banana, my sugar goes sky high, but I can have ice cream, believe it or not, or a cookie and my sugar doesn't move. Now, it doesn't mean you should live on ice cream and cookies, right. although I would love that. Yeah, right? it would be nice. But you may, you may not have that. So there's a lot of moving parts and factors that we are looking at, not just on the surface about how people should eat. For another example is it's great to have protein before you eat a carb. Mm -hmm. So one of our Brock users who's in the beta two, he came to us and he actually had diabetes already. He didn't know it, okay. but I was pretty sure. I showed him some data even before his came back to prep him and say, you know, I think this is what you're going to look like under the surface. And it turns out he was even worse. He had a hemoglobin A1C because he was 40. Mm -hmm. And the data I was showing him was in a 20 year old who already had signs of insulin resistance. Okay. And when I showed him the data, he was a, a regular diabetic by then, had no idea, could not get the continuous glucose monitor prescribed for him. He's now lost a significant amount of weight. And in six months, he's no longer going to be a diabetic. That's fantastic. He's introduced resistant exercise. But just this week, I see the sugar on the app fly by me because our app contains the CGM okay. woven into your story. Your health portfolio is the cool. way I like to think about I it. I like that. And yeah, and all the biomarkers we measure. And there are five that are critical that I'm happy to talk about. And I see it flash by me at 178. I'm like, oh my God, what did he do? It was early in the morning. So I knew he must've had something for breakfast. Maybe he was working out. Yeah, I was going to ask go that. Sky high. Yeah. Right. Then about 20 minutes later, it shows up 
because I'm also directly connected through Libra Linka, which is cool. usually just for friends and family, but I like to follow people directly. And his sugar now was in the 50s because there's a slight delay getting into mm-hmm. our app. And so I actually couldn't help myself. I immediately called him and I said, hey, what did you do this morning? It turns out he went and got a blueberry muffin. And for him, a muffin is deadly. He had no protein that preceded it. And he had learned to eat at home. So his answer was, well, I know that might happen, but I couldn't believe the drop. And what happens there, and maybe this is something you've already learned, and we know it from measuring oral glucose tolerance tests and from people's symptoms, that if you have a pure carb meal, like a banana or a bran muffin, about within an hour, your sugar goes sky high, but then it drops dramatically because insulin is being manufactured. Mm -hmm. And when insulin goes up, some people are really symptomatic and their sugar drops even lower, sometimes to a dangerous point. They could feel jittery, angry, sleepy, and they know they usually have to eat something. A lot of times it's a donut and a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock. That's not good for you either. And so There are patterns that we recognize and we can individually, N of one, direct people as to the choices they need to make so they can own that future. So in this case, I I said, listen, you either have to prepare a trail mix or grab a bag of prepackaged little cheeses. And before you put anything in your mouth that looks or smells like a carb, have protein with fiber and fat. I'm so I went so on glad. a little bit there, but no, I I'm actually you'd be your timing of bringing that up is perfect because inside of um, my coaching program, we do a weekly group call with all of our one-on-one clients. So they're all getting individualized nutrition, but then every single week we bring them together to do Q and A and different topics. And last night we actually got in this like 25 minute conversation because I have a client right now who um, she's a nurse, so. She's been having some issues with her blood sugar and we've been looking at different things in her lab work and we couldn't get her a CGM, but she was willing to prick her finger for a little while because she feels comfortable doing it. So I have her using a glucose monitor and we started talking about this because we've been taking the data just for like a week. And um, basically to sum up the story and why I think this was so great that you brought this up is we were talking about bananas and coffee. And talking about like grabbing something quickly in the morning, timing of your workout, not wanting to work out on a full stomach, but still feeling like you need a little something in your system. And to just kind of bring it back together, we have a rule, so to speak, inside of the way we look at nutrition with the fitness fix that we don't do naked carbs. And that means not having a carbohydrate completely by itself. And you did such a great job just clarifying and reiterating what happens in terms of the insulin response in the body. And it goes back to everything you were saying earlier about carbohydrates and just like the survival mechanism, right? Like your body is wired to protect itself for the two most important biological things that we were put on this earth for as humans, survive and reproduce. Absolutely. And that, and that's why these genes for diabetes have survived so nicely. Mm-hmm. So all of us on earth globally, because I look, I've taken care of people from around the world. It is no different. The expression of the disease is different. So um, Asian, like Eastern Asian Indians who have diabetes can look fantastic on the outside. That's less common for us Caucasians or Black or Hispanic. And so the expression of how we look and what, so diabetes isn't tied to obesity per se. There are lots of people who can be overweight, but not necessarily on a terrible path to diabetes, but there are thin people who could be skinny fat. And if you don't eat appropriately for your body, and that leaves you a lot of room. So for some people, intermittent fasting may make sense. Other people would like to eat a little more freely. I think it works in every way for every person. Just you want to stay away from things that for you in particular might be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, before we run out of time, I want to make sure we go back to what you mentioned about, I think it was the five different biomarkers that you're monitoring for your clients inside of your app. So could you tell me a little bit more about what those are and why they're important? Definitely. Okay. So what we extrapolated from the center, which is a bespoke program that's quite expensive because we dig in deep to every person that we see, but we get immediate 
responses. And then it's a process. We extrapolated the most important variables, just like I explained that over the years, and this was just about five years ago that I started recognizing that everybody is on the path to be a diabetic. It could happen when you're in your 20s and it could happen in your 90s. And I've had cases at both extremes. It just depends how you live life and the combination of, of variants in your genes your sleep and all these other aspects. So the five most important biomarkers to me are fasting, that first of all, you should be fasting, ideally 12 hours, but no less than eight. And you wanna look at hemoglobin A1C because in relationship to fasting sugar or glucose and fasting insulin. The other two that we look at are a form of cholesterol, which we call the cholesterol risk ratio, okay. which is total cholesterol over HDL. And we also look at free testosterone. Those are all vital. They are so vital, yet, believe it or not, testosterone isn't approved for women, even though it's a vital hormone that we all need to protect our health as we age and stop chronic disease. Because that's the real goal with reversing biological mm -hmm. aging, stopping chronic disease like heart disease, Alzheimer's, stroke, diabetes, neurological decline. And we, we can do that. And so owning those five biomarkers, and we actually add one more that I think of as a biomarker, but it isn't a blood measurement. It's doing a body composition yeah. because um, based, uh, the BMI um just like finger sticks and CGM are very variable. Right. You can have a lot of muscle and be in great shape, but your BMI is high. You can also be skinny fat and have a low BMI and it's not, doesn't mean you're healthy. So we believe in directly measuring muscle and, um, and fat as well as visceral fat and fat in the liver um, and also water, which is part of the process. And that shows real reversal. Those are critically important as well. So we put that all together with a story that someone presents with. And that story consists of answering a few questions in the app, looking at your um, family history, looking at your personal history, giving us some insights into your energy, your exercise, your sleep, your food. Do you fast three times a week and the other days you're too busy, you're running out of the house or you have to take care of your kids or... Um, or it's deliberate, like you give yourself a break and some days you do eat because your, your day mm -hmm. is different. And all of that means we're looking inside of a person's day-to-day -day life to help them make decisions that they're going to own in partnership with us so we can help guide them to optimal health. That's what the Grok app promises, this personal guide to precision medicine or personalized precision medicine, where you get data, hard data, objective data to help make decisions like about a banana versus a cookie yeah. and what that does. That's amazing. How does that sound? Yeah, it's amazing. And I can yeah. say, you know, I love what you mentioned, like about the examples with hemoglobin A1C, because that that same client I was actually mentioning something that we have seen with her in her own lab work. And we've done it multiple times because I've had the pleasure of working with her for almost two years, which is great to have that kind of history together. Um she didn't necessarily express and and you mentioned this a few times and I'm in full alignment with you on this about a lot of the reference ranges that we see on lab work and I myself will go off of much tighter ones with my clients. So the report that comes back from their doctor says, oh, in range, in range. I then look at it against some of my resources that I have from certifications that I've done with nutrition and I have a different opinion. And in her case, something that was really interesting was there wasn't as much concern around her I don't think her insulin was done, but there wasn't as much concern around her fasted blood glucose. It was higher, but it was still just like right at the point where it's technically in range. 90 to 95. Yeah, exactly. But her hemoglobin A1C was very high. And that what was what kind of like made me have an alarm go off to be like, wait a second, we need to look into this a little bit further here. And then you mentioned testosterone too, and I've had my own experience with that. You talked about birth control and referenced that and um, between a combination of contraceptive and then also a period in my early 20s where I went through a really long period of bad insomnia and uh, just not great sleep. I experienced firsthand pretty low testosterone levels for somebody who is now only 29. Um, and that was alarming for me, but it made a lot of sense to then have that information to translate to some of the changes that I was seeing on my body, for example. 
or even You're how exactly I was feeling right. Too. And if I, if I got a few, I know we're going to have to wrap up soon. I don't want to keep you, but if I got a little bit about your family history, if we ever do this again and you want to be, you know, like a guinea pig where yeah, I that would can be talk about it, um, I would suspect that probably there's heart disease or stroke in your family, cardiometabolic conditions, if that's the experience you had in your 20s. And when you take birth control, you're shutting down your physiological hormones. As soon as you do that, that's like being 35, 40 or 45. Mm-hmm. And you're already expressing, it's like being pregnant and having gestational diabetes. All of those triggers cause us to go downhill. And that's what aging does. So there are definite approaches. We have a lot of women in their 20s on birth control who that's the best that's the best form, for example, for each of these women in terms of contraceptives. And we start them on testosterone because they have a family member who's diabetic or had a heart attack even at a young age. And we don't want them to go down that route. And so there are ways to look at this critically, just like you explained with the nurse. As soon as a woman is hemoglobin A1C starts approaching 5.7, alarm bells go off. If your sugar, when you wake up, your fasting glucose isn't 70 to 80, you're not optimal. And I mean, on both ends, if it's 60 or 90, yeah, you don't wait until you're just about to be sick. That's our conventional health care center, mm-hmm. you know, uh, care. We, we wait for people to get really sick and then we jump all over it. Uh, In fact, one of my favorite sayings is you've had this, if you know, you can detect these things years, if not decades before. And just this morning, I read an article about Alzheimer's from the National Institutes of Health, where I learned a lot of my research and training. That's where I went to train in clinical research. And it was talking about Alzheimer's. And I was thrilled to see, yes, you can detect these things years, even decades before. All of this aging chronic disease, which costs our country close to $4 trillion, are detectable decades before we actually get really sick. We just attribute it to not having enough sleep or working too hard or things of that nature. Yeah. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. And I know I mentioned to you before we started recording that I usually do a little lightning round at the end, but I'm going to adjust it a little bit and we'll call it more of like hot takes on the hot topics because I think there's two big things that I don't want to press you to try to like condense your answer in less than a minute or anything like that. But I know that if I didn't ask them from your perspective, it would be a follow up question. And again, questions that I get from clients and potential clients via Instagram all the time. And I think it's important when we have somebody with as much knowledge and experience as you do and all of these real life examples to pull on. I definitely want to hear your take. So the first one is going to be you start you just started talking about it around, um, you know, hormone replacement therapy, testosterone for women just what are your thoughts on it because some people are really against it and I have more and more clients especially in the age range of 40s into approaching 50 maybe mid 50s I'm seeing more consistency with a lot of women going through perimenopause and I I want to know your thoughts on where do you think that lies in terms of providing them additional support so that as you said we can be optimal in our health too It's very hard to be optimal without hormones. So I'll say right up front, my deep, deep training is reproductive endocrinology and hormones, but not just in infertility, across whole lifespan from little children to 50, 60, 70. So I have a particular pattern, but I believe testosterone is critical for everyone. And by not giving women testosterone, when they actually hit menopause, they hit a wall. If there's a family history of breast cancer, I am cautious about estrogen, but we only use one form of estrogen and not oral estrogen. So in the 40s, I'm not an advocate of taking the birth control pill. There are exceptions because again, N of one. Right. Um, The thing about perimenopause that's scary is a lot of doctors uh, and and, uh, we call them clients, but let me say patients because we don't want sick people. So they're not patients. I don't do that in academic centers because I'd have my head handed to me. (laughs) I like that um, distinction though. Yeah. Um, They can have irregular menses and it's very common. And some women who had irregular menses in their thirties can actually become regular. And years ago, a lot of them found out they had a change of life baby because they couldn't get pregnant. They never thought about it again. Mm -hmm. And they, and it was no IVF or anything like that. And all of a sudden at 45, they're pregnant and they were thrilled, of course. But if you have irregular menses, you need to see the doctor because sometimes it's unopposed estrogen. 
and there's a chance of getting uterine cancer. Speaking of that, I strongly believe in progesterone for the brain, for sleep, to reduce anxiety, and testosterone and progesterone are safe hormones, meaning they're actually anti-cancer and they have broad effects on the entire body, just like thyroid. Thyroid affects memory, cognition. If you have too much thyroid, by the way, your periods can be skimpy and you miss them. If you have too little Mm -hmm. thyroid, you actually bleed more. And so there's a ton of things that don't seem to align, but that's, that's the work I do scientifically. So I'm an advocate. I actually don't call it hormone replacement because I don't think we're mother nature. I call it optimizing hormones. I like that. Hormone replacement would be following what your usual menses would be like every week. So in the first week of, of a cycle, if let's say you have a 26 to 36 day cycle, let's use 28, mm-hmm. you're ovulating 14 days before you get your period. And as such, estrogen is pretty sky high, usually 100 to 200. We don't look for levels that replace a regular cycle because you're not regularly cycling. Your ovaries have finished their work and right. they're now done. Sure. And we women hit a wall. It's different for men, so I won't go into that because men by every decade can slow down, but not us women. We're hitting a wall at average age of 50 because that's when we stop getting periods within the year and we go into menopause. So I'm an advocate because I don't think it's possible to be very, very healthy uh, without physiological hormonal replacement and optimizing hormones. I really appreciate that appreciate that take and I, I like the way you worded that too. So thank you for sharing that. And then the last one I'm gonna ask you because we did mention it and like I said, I get this question a lot. Let's play this out as a scenario. So let's say you have somebody who's coming to you and does have a considerable amount of weight to lose. They feel that they have tried everything and because of their own research, marketing, whatever we want to call it, they are entertaining something like an Ozempic or any other weight loss drug in that category. I don't want to just pick on that one in particular, but what would you say to that person in terms of things that they should consider before making that choice? And is it even one that you would entertain with a, with someone at all? Absolutely. We've entertained the entire spectrum because remember I've grown this field over the last two and a half decades. I think there are That's a smart, Ozempic and Manjara are excellent uh, medications because they take what's natural in the body, the peptides, and they extend its use over a week. The problem is they're not without side effects, particularly Mm -hmm. nausea, GI side effects. Some people get reflux. There's other more serious side effects. I haven't seen them like thyroid disease. If there's th- a certain kind of thyroid cancer in your family, you shouldn't take it. If there's a multiple, a kind of endocrine disorder that involves multiple endocrine glands, you shouldn't take it. But having said that knowledge is power. It's not wisdom, but it's power. So what I recommend and what I do with our clients is we collect anything that's possible about their health, their family history, and the way they live life. And then we begin to make adjustments. We start with the continuous glucose monitor. And we know that Ozempic is definitely going to be in play if it's necessary. And sometimes it's more necessary for someone who's not massively overweight, because if they're not doing anything right and they're massively overweight or they have other conditions that we can fix, then we will start with the highest priority as a as to sure. begin. Also, remember that you're you're playing with your body in a way that if you're in your 20s, 30s, or teens, you probably can protect muscle to a bigger degree than if you're in your 30s and it gets worse and worse. So by taking Ozempic and Manjaro, it's not the Ozempic face. Anytime you lose weight, you're gonna get an yeah. Ozempic face. Yeah. My mother used to use that as an excuse when she was 50 to say, if I lose weight, I lose my face. So I knew that even before medical school, you know, I would say, mom, like why? And she's right. She's a thousand percent right. And so um, it's more about where does it fit in the spectrum of all the options you have? Are you eating pure carb meals? Something you mentioned, mm-hmm. you go over, what is your sugar? Now you had this nurse do finger sticks, but it might be a great idea for her to get a continuous glucose monitor because then she could really see what food and lack of sleep, right. working too hard, stress does to her sugar and um, and um, how that all works together. So I would start with a little bit more complexity. And that's why we created the Grok app, Crystal. We know that 
that will give a person a great jump start to figuring out what they have to focus on and what's going on. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, I think that's where a lot of times people's frustration or feeling like that they've reached this point of they just don't know what to do comes from because there truly are so many things that we can look at. So it's great that, you know, you're coming up with a truly a system and a protocol to be able to kind of put that all together and then show people what we can prioritize first and foremost. And then ultimately, too, something I always remind clients who ask me about these different things is, If you are going to do this, we have to make sure that the lifestyle changes that are required to maintain these results are non-negotiable for you as well. I agree, but I may be a little different than everybody else because I've treated thousands. Every single one has been a success. So you're right. They have to have an investment in their own Mm -hmm. health. They have to want to know the truth about their health. But I see a lot more flexibility in choices people can make. We even had people with diagnoses of metabolic syndrome, which is very, very common. And we even see it in 12 year olds and 14 year olds where they can't manage. They have a more serious version of those variant genes. Mm -hmm. And after a while, if we're treating them appropriately, they actually can switch off those genes and then they stay, they stay the right optimal weight and combination of muscle and fat. So we believe in Mardi Gras days, you know, where you can have fun I don't like life would not be fun. Like for me, if I couldn't enjoy some aspects of food, that that's the great story I'll end on. When I started with Bietta, I saw how it affected your mind and your stomach because that peptide is like Ozempic. It was just Mm -hmm. early in the days where you had to take it right before you ate. And I love chocolate lava cake, you know, dark chocolate with the lava inside. There we go. And I was planning to go out to a restaurant and I was taking the Bietta, testing it, and I couldn't enjoy the lava cake. So the next time I had to do it, I didn't take it before eating because I wanted to enjoy sure. it. You know, in moderation, which is something my father taught me when my sister used to go on the flat, on the peppers, green peppers, cheese, and steak diet, the kind of <laughs> modification of, of keto. He would say, that is insane, just moderation, you know, balance. Before yep. I went to med school, by the way. So I am um, I'm a little I'm much more flexible. It's not all or nothing because unless it's dangerous, it's it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's that's what we really try to teach our clients, too, because the all or nothing mindset is just what perpetuates the cycle of feeling like you're always starting over because you then, like you said, I like the Mardi Gras days um, analogy. That's great. That's a great reference because you want to be able to go out and live your life. And and a lot of our clients get to a point where they're just like, I feel like all I'm doing is thinking about food. And that's something that we want to be able to free them from because that is it that really takes a toll on you. And again, becomes this cycle of like then not feeling confident and it just spilling over into so many different aspects of your life and even who you are. A thousand percent. It's what we think of as yo-yo dieting yeah. and yo-yo. And you get tired of it. I've been there where you might crave things. And if you can have a process that allows you to enjoy mm-hmm. the day-to-day life so that you have fun, you're doing it in a sensible way. And you're still going to be able to optimize your health, lose the fat, put on muscle. And that's really our goal. Because if we can do that, we'd actually stop chronic disease in this century. And so it's an exciting path to be on. And I'm delighted to be here and share my thoughts. Yeah, very exciting. And I just want to thank you again for your time and all the information that you shared with us today. And I think we'll definitely have to have you back because there are so many other things we can talk about and go into in more detail. And before I do officially let you go, I want to make sure everybody can stay connected with you, learn more about the Grok app as it continues to develop. So where, and I'll link all of this in the show notes, of course, but where can we find you on the internet? So uh, the best way to read about the background, but it, it's undergoing change, but it's still fun, I think, is cometemd.com. But we have started a website for Grok Health, and that's spelled G-R-O-Q, health.com. And it speaks to what our challenges are. The cases on there are real. We don't have as many testimonies as cool. we should because every single client it's is a different. testimonial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, and then that is probably right now we still have 
the wait list where people can sign up. It's not ready for prime time. We are actually working with companies now because a lot of folks who come to me want their companies to have access to it, but not at the price, that price sure. point. So in Grok right now, we're still working to bring the price point down and to be able to deliver on the promise for thousands, if not millions of Amazing. people in the future. Yeah. Amazing. Well, great. Yeah. We're also offering it to people who have an audience. And so at some point you might be a candidate for it. Um, I know since you're right in New Jersey, you could get into New York easily. And if something you're interested in exploring, we can talk about that. Or you yeah. can talk to JT. I don't know who spoke to you, Kennedy or ha Hannah or one of those. And um, I work with Jeff at this end, so he can help coordinate that. But we're slowly going to release it to people who are out there and in the press and have opinions that are consistent, because obviously that's what we believe in so strongly. Absolutely. Excellent. I look forward to all of that. And of course, would love to meet you in person, too, because we're not far away, which is great. That'd so, be fun. Thank you again for everything. We really appreciate you. And for everybody who tuned in today, you guys know the drill. If you got even a little bit of value, and I can't imagine that you got only a little bit from this entire conversation, do us a favor, share it, whether that's on your own social media or sending a text to a friend if you feel like any of this relates to them. Family member, great way to spark conversation about your health. Maybe you don't even know a lot about your own family history. This could certainly be a way to bring it up, right? So do us a favor, share it, and make sure you tag us at thefix.officialpod if you do so. And as always, from wherever you're listening from, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.